Hello, everyone. I am here today with Mitch Joel. And when Google wants someone to explain the latest developments in marketing to the top brands in the world, they bring Mitch to the Googleplex in Mountain View, California. Marketing Magazine dubbed him the rock star of digital marketing and called him one of North America's leading digital visionaries. And back in 2006, he was named one of the most influential authorities on blog marketing in the world. Mitch is president of Miram, a global digital marketing agency operating in close to 20 countries with over 2,000 employees, although he does prefer the term media hacker. He is also an author, blogger, podcaster, and passionate speaker who connects with people wor worldwide by sharing his innovation insights on digital marketing and business transformation. He has been named one of the top 100 online marketers in the world and was awarded the highly prestigious Canada's Top 40 Under 40. And today we are going to be talking about virtual and augmented reality and the best uses for businesses and brands. Mitch, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks so much for inviting me. No problem. Uh, obviously, with your uh, bio there, I think we all are excited to see what you have to say. And, and like I just mentioned, I've been following you for years and super stoked to have you on the podcast and to uh, talk about this cutting edge, uh, cutting edge topic here. Uh, I mean, it's you know some of this stuff has been around for a little bit, but it still hasn't really uh, become mainstream just yet. So it's always nice to kind of be ahead of the curve on this and uh, learning. Uh, some best uses for this stuff. But before we dig into, you know, uses and how, how brands and businesses can use this, I, I want you to first explain for listeners what virtual reality and what augmented reality are. Right, we have all day to do this, right, because it's so easy to just <laughs> summarize in the world. Um, right. The simplest way that I explain this to people is we are taking what we see on the Internet and the information and how we have experiences and moving it from a flat screen to basically our real or three-dimensional world. So virtual reality is these sort of weird, interesting-looking head things that we put on that we strap onto our face. And the big difference between virtual reality and augmented reality is that virtual reality is fully immersive, meaning if you're wearing the headset and somebody can kick you in the groin and you would not be aware of it until you got hit, you're probably in virtual reality. <laughs> um, augmented, reality yeah, uh, augmented reality allows you to see the world as you currently see it with information from the internet or three-dimensional information layered on top of it. So augmented reality would be things like Microsoft and their HoloLens product. Or if anyone has tried Pokemon Go, that was augmented reality because you were looking through your phone, seeing your environment as it is, and seeing mm -hmm. little Pokemon monsters on top of it. Virtual reality is things like Oculus Rift, which uh, you know, is Facebook's platform. Mm -hmm. So virtual reality is more like you have to have something that you're wearing, basically, to, to take advantage of virtual reality and versus augmented reality can be viewed on a flat screen, but it's a, it's a different type of um, experience. Is well, that, well is that correct? not really, not really, because in theory, augmented reality, like a Microsoft HoloLens, is its own system that you wear on your head like you would an Oculus Rift. The difference is what you're looking at is your real world, which is augmented with this digital information on top of it versus virtual reality, where you really can't see the physical world you are immersed in and blocked out of your real world. Gotcha, gotcha. Very, okay, very cool. Now, the, these, um, they're, they're similar but different. I, I, it, you know, my experience so far as virtual reality is basically the next step up from augmented reality, and we'll, we'll get into to some of this stuff. But how would somebody just getting started get going with virtual reality? And, and then you can go ahead and follow up and talk about the same question with augmented reality. How, how would people get started if they're, if they're interested in, in dipping their toes into this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a bigger question, actually, than sort of how do you just get started. It's a tough thing mm -hmm. to just say, well, you, you know, it's sort of, it, I actually would reverse engineer that and say, what are you trying to accomplish with your business? Okay. What types of engagement do you want to create for your customer? Um, is there an opportunity for just you're doing it for PR? Is there an opportunity you want to be first in your industry? Is this more from the innovation side of your business where you want to tinker and toil with you know, new and emerging technologies? So I think you have to really start with the, the why, not the what. 
Um, mm -hmm. But if you are interested in building a bridge between what you're currently doing and your business with your digital products and services to moving to a virtual augmented reality, I do think there are formats and platforms you can start testing and tinkering with that include things like 360 degree images that we're seeing on places like Facebook or 360 degree video, which we're starting to see more and more of. Uh, YouTube has that, Facebook supports it as well. So I sort of see video and more 360 images as I call it the gateway drug to mm -hmm. virtual and AR because you can do it now, you can post it now. It's the type of stuff that you know, YouTube and Facebook are almost giving you free SEO on, meaning they're so hungry for people to try this technology because they're both so highly vested in these mm -hmm. platforms, Google with, with Tango and, and, and Google Cardboard, and obviously mm -hmm. Facebook with Oculus, that if you post, you know, 360 degree video, they're more than likely gonna push that up the feed and maybe not make you pay so much for, um, you know, boosting it because they want more content like that on the platform. So I think that that's a good gateway drug to test your chops internally to doing this. Um, you have to understand this is very, very new stuff. So it's not mm -hmm. like there's this out of the gate solutions and everybody has them and the video editing software is all there and everything's there. This is still a bit in the MacGyver area of things where we're cobbling this together with like bubble gum and chicken wire and paper clips. It's not mm -hmm. a sort of solid format as we have. If you look at, let's say, the trajectory of e-commerce from you know big, big e-commerce sites like Demandware to back-end providers like Digital River to where we are now with like a Shopify where you can basically build a site for you know 10 bucks a month. That mm -hmm. evolution on the VR, AR side hasn't transpired yet. It's still very yeah. early days. So for all of the amazing stuff you can do, whether it's through a phone or through one of those HMDs, those head-mounted displays, to get the stuff onto it is not quote-unquote obvious. It's not complex and crazy and tough, but there's a lot of steps from how you produce your content to how you edit and stitch it together to understanding the usability and experience of people. There's just a lot of – it's very new. Mm hmm Now, yeah, and, you know, normally, like if you look in one of those 1970s tech, you know, uh, magazines, you have microwaves that cost like $2,500, you know, and then technology catches up and everything gets less expensive. And right now you're looking at Oculus Rift, at least last time I looked, if, you know, a few months ago, it was in a couple thousand dollars, if I'm not mistaken. Um, do you see that coming down? I mean, is that part of what you're, you're, you're seeing where this will head? because it's, it is pretty expensive to get into now. There are other solutions like you mentioned with the Google Cardboard and stuff, but do you, have you seen anything in the marketplace where that stuff is starting to become, you know, a little bit more affordable or has that not, has that not even kicked off yet? Well, you know, price adjusts based off of users and penetration and user adoption. So there's mm -hmm. always this sort of economics behind this thing where right now it's early adopters in early days, and while it's being offered commercially to the average consumer, it is sort of an arm's length away, and it depends on how you see adoption. For example, I've seen uh, I think it was Samsung in Europe do things where they're giving the headset away when you buy a phone just to create the energy around the adoption. So there are things that, that have happened to move it forward, but you're right, it's not ubiquitous yet. It's not, there, there's not this massive, you know, lineups of people in the streets demanding the HoloLens or demanding the Oculus and now what's going to happen is it's going to become hyper-commoditized and prices are going to drop and different platforms are going to merge and things like that. No, we're early, early days, and I liken this very much to the early days of the first web browser. And we're sort of mm -hmm. just there. Um, there's no doubt that the people who have played with technologies and been through the evolution of technological platforms see and understand what this is. And at the same time, I recognize that anybody who I speak to about it, and even as the words come out of my mouth in conversation with you, Dave, I feel like anybody listening to this is like, oh, like here's the tall, bald guy dressed in black talking to me about the future, <laughs> which is who I am typically. Um, but, you know, I'm always reminded of uh, – I, I throw this quote out quite a bit when I talk about this, and I talk about it a lot. Um, I was I, – you know, I have a podcast called Six Pixels of Separation that I've been doing for over a decade every single week, and it's one of the greatest joys I have in my life. I get to speak with smart people every week and have really in-depth conversations. And recently I had Kevin Kelly on, and Kevin Kelly is one of the co-founders of Wired, 
a very well-known author, most recently wrote a great book called The Inevitable about technological trends that are coming. And he was asking me, he's an older guy, he's asking me about what I'm working on. I told him, you know, I'm very excited about the applications for brands of virtual reality and augmented reality. And he was sort of like, yeah, and uh, so how has that audience taken that message? And I was like, yeah, no, it's a lot of crickets and a lot of stares and a lot of raised mm -hmm. eyebrows and a lot of folded arms and a lot of sort of body language that says, you were doing so well until you started talking crazy, you know, like that type of thing. And mm -hmm. he said to me something really profound. He said, you know, the interesting thing about the stuff we all do in our world is that what people don't get is that the future happens very, very slowly and then all at once. Mm. And that saying to me really True. embodies the state of VR and AR. So if you look back and we were talking about e-commerce, it's been 20 plus years of the commercialization of e-commerce and so many businesses and brands are still not even fully optimized for e-commerce, let alone mobile commerce and things like that or social commerce. And mm -hmm. we could look at that and go, wow, like Shopify came out. I'm very proud of those guys. I know the founders, good friends with them, $3 billion market cap, phenomenal. You know, that business was almost a 10-year journey. The cycle of e-commerce was almost a two-decade journey. But yet mm -hmm. it does feel like it happened all at once, and suddenly Amazon is the world's largest retailer, et cetera, et cetera. I think that VR and AR will very much play into that aphorism of Kevin Kelly, that the future happens very slowly and then all at once. I saw that first web browser. I felt like it was going to change everything. And I've been on that journey now for a long, long time. But it still, to me, feels like it happens all at once. And I'm either mm -hmm. feeling sometimes behind it or, I'm, you know, with, with VR and AR, I really feel oh, like man. I'm somewhat ahead of it, but in general, not. Man, imagine how everybody, everybody else feels, Mitch, if you feel like you're behind on something, you know? But I there's mean, a lot it, of it, things, it, Dave, right? There's a lot of things. Yeah. Oh, it's, 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 I mean, it can be overwhelming. I mean, it is overwhelming, and that can be. It, it is, is overwhelming. overwhelming. But, you, you know, you just, that's why, you know, you got to, you know, continue to learn from people like yourself and, and the other many other great experts out there and just to stay on top of it as best you can and, and, just do the best you can, but you got to stay on top of this stuff because marketing is ever changing, and to, to be on top of it and to stand out from the crowd, you know, it's try to take advantage of these other opportunities before everybody else does. And once everybody else does, well, guess what? There's going to be something called ZR or something that's coming along the lines that that we'll need to to, to learn about and do. But I think one of the one of the main things though, where you you know you have those folded arms and you have those blank stares. Um, and this is coming from somebody that's probably um, staring at you like that, that's talking to you right now. And and that's just like, okay, well, how do I start? And and you brought up a good a good point earlier um, about, okay, well, here, here's a way you can do the 360 degree video. No, that's not going to be something where you see Nemo sh swimming up top or, you know, sharks below you and stuff like the really cool stuff that, you know, high production can, can, can do. But you can still give people some cool, like, you know, um, you know, real estate agents could do all kinds of really cool stuff with this. You know, just the 360 degree videos. I know a lot of them are, but to, yeah. to take to the next level. So l let's let's just help people just get started with that. And and I want you know we have people who probably you know big budgets and, and small budgets that are listening. In your experience, just getting started with that. And I think this is a good good first breadcrumb to give people. What what. You know, and I went back and forth and looking for you know cameras and stuff on the best way to do. Where, where do you? Where can you point to somebody? Hey, if you want to get started, this is a great you know low end 360 degree camera that you can get going, and then you can just incorporate it into your Facebook you know videos and whatnot, and then um, maybe give it an advanced um, step up for if you really want to start doing some bigger stuff with it. Can you give some point some people in the right direction for the technology or the cameras needed for? Um, those purposes of dipping their toes in just on the 360-degree part? Yeah, I mean, look, it's really cheap. You can just shoot a panoramic picture with your great iPhone or your Android, <laughs> and to be honest, okay. you really can. Um, there you go. If you wanted to get really high-end, you would have to find some form of panoramic platform for the higher-end cameras and or cameras that shoot that way and or stitching slash editing software to be, do that functionality as the output of the pictures you take. Uh, you can also shoot basically video and turn that into still-ish type stuff if you want to go from video back to images. So it's not really about like, oh, there's a couple of these great cameras on the market. I'm sure there are. I actually don't even really know, and I, I, I'm really candid about what I do know and I don't know. Mm -hmm. I tend to not be a hardware dude. 
I tend to be more of a, this is the output of it, this is okay. what the opportunities are versus uh, the, it's almost like I, I, I understand code, but I can't code, if you know what I mean. So I understand no, sure. the merits of it. I've run a successful agency for, for a long time, but I can't really code. I get what it is. I get what the output of it is. So asking me, like, which cameras is asking me, like, what type of code should I start to sure, build my sure, thing sure. in? And I tend mm -hmm. to shy away from that because, candidly, I, I just don't know. What I can tell you is that the platforms are available for you to distribute them. So like your Facebooks and your YouTubes of the world and your Googles of the world are providing software development kits, SDKs, there are APIs, so application process things that you can, application developers rather, and tools that you can plug into your own software to do a lot of stuff in early, early days. And I think the best thing to do is really ask the people who are the experts on the hardware and development side of it. But where, I, I think that the better, the better idea is when people say like, where to start, I think it's just making a decision. Do you want to do something that's augmented reality based? Do you want to do something that's a virtual reality based? I think that's important because they're, as much as we lump them together, they're two very different experiences. Next is once you figure out like who are the people and how do we do this in the sort of, I call it the sort of sausage factory of it, like how does it get made? I think the important question to, to figure out is what are you making it for? My general thoughts on this are you want to be able to control the situation as much as possible. So one of the favorite examples that I talk about when I talk about this being a sort of experiential marketing platform is Wells Fargo actually did this, um, you know, so similar to I guess what most of us do, it's like, you know, you go to like a, you go to some sort of a event and they have a booth there or they have an experience there. And what they did was, I guess they figured, you know, hey, we're Wells Fargo. It's not going to necessarily be easy to get people to come over to our booth or our area. What they actually did was they built some stuff in Oculus, so virtual reality. And what they did was they put these at their experiences. And the idea was they wanted people to see them more as a playful bank. So these experiences weren't like you're, you're suddenly in a virtual reality bank. It really was nothing more than simple games that allowed people to experience Oculus to see what virtual reality is, to go, wow, this is so cool. And mm -hmm. at the same time, well, look, they spent a couple minutes more than they probably would have spent had the bank been hand handing out piggy banks and calendars or whatever else, you know, whatever they do these days. And it really wasn't like the experience of what VR was, wasn't really related to the bank so much as it was just games. I like that, not just because it's not connected. I don't think that's what I like about it. What I like about it is the fact that, you know, you have two or three Oculus sets you have your staff on hand to show people how to do it so that they themselves aren't stumbling through technology and having a bad experience. You can really control the environment because it's your environment. And you can have an outcome where either you're getting press, media, people are talking about it, people are sharing it, or getting mm -hmm. people to say, hey, you know, if you're going to this event, you need to go check out the Wells Fargo experience because it's there and it's virtual reality. It'll be your chance to try it out. So I like I think more about how to get it done from that side, like why are you doing this, which one will you go with, where's the opportunity for you, how do you do it in a way where it creates the best brand experience. My fear is that there's a lot of, I call them speed bumps right now, to make virtual reality and augmented reality more mass accepted. And I really believe it's incumbent on the intermediary, so in this case it would be the brand, between the brand, you know, virtual reality, then the brand, and then the customer, to make sure that what the customer sees is a great experience. And that's really hard to do because it's just the nature of where we're at with this stuff right now. Sure. No, absolutely. And in good, at least for me personally, and I assume other people might be the same way, is, you know, use cases, you know, examples, like real life stuff that's going on and what other people are doing is, is a good way for me personally to wrap my brain around some stuff. Like, you, you, you definitely seem you know, very, um, you know, big picture and, you know, at, you know, the why versus the how, you know, and the what, basically, which is, I'm, you know, that's where they all say to start, right? You know, starting with Steve Jobs and, and how they went around their, their business model and marketing model and everything. So that that's awesome. And so, I would, but I would love to see if you can talk more about some examples. Give us some use cases. Like, where, where are some of the most awesome other – I mean, you gave some, a good example of Wells Fargo, but can you give some yeah. other examples of how some other companies, small brands, medium-sized, big brands, or whatever, whatever sure. comes to mind for VR and AR that you've seen out there that you just really are fascinated with? Yeah, I'll give you two uh, – I can give you a lot, actually. I'm trying to think which – I'm going to give you two. One is um, – McDonald's. Uh, somewhere in one of the European countries, what McDonald's did was they took those Happy Meal boxes 
-hmm. and you're able to, once you're done your meal, fold it up in a way that makes that the actual oh. Google Cardboard version That's awesome. of the application. So you download the app on your phone, McDonald's virtual reality app, you fold up your Happy Meal and it becomes a viewer, you slide your phone in and suddenly your kid can have a virtual reality-like experience. I want to caveat this and say it wasn't the best experience, and like I saw them, I went, whoa! But I thought the, the way to get that customer, as I, as I said earlier, that intermediary between the brand and the experience connected was really powerful, right? They're in the restaurant, they're eating, they have this box that they would typically toss away. You're turning it into a piece of technology. They might take it with them, they might leave it on their night table, they might try it again later with the application, show it to a friend. I felt like that was a really good way in a small control way because they didn't roll this out across the world, they chose you know one specific European country. I think it was Sweden. I could be wrong. Uh, that I thought that was really powerful. My favorite use to also explain it also illustrates I think the things you like. I think the coolest part about AR and VR is what you can and can't do with the technology that you can't definitely do with the current internet and mobile experiences that we have. And this one illustrates that. Um, Lowe's has been really aggressive in this space. Lowe's is the, uh, the, the home hardware type of uh, big retailer. And they created a virtual reality experience that allows you to obviously do the obvious. What's the obvious? It's here's the dimensions of my kitchen, and you can literally go into virtual reality and see what it would be like to walk through the kitchen as you have fully redesigned it from the tiles to the to the faucets to the handles to the cupboards, and that's great. And yeah, you, you have the same reaction most people have. It's like, wow, that'd be super cool, but let me kick it up and really show you what made the virtual experience something that you can only do in virtual reality and couldn't do anywhere else. There's a feature on it that allows you to put in your height. Now, why your height? Because what you can actually do is lower the height to the height of your child and be able to walk through in virtual reality your future wow. kitchen and see it from the perspective of, let's say, for example, your five-year-old kid. Will they yeah. be able to reach the top drawer? What will they see? How will it, will it look intimidating to them, scary? Will it look open, closed? And, you know, it's, it's something that's somewhat minor, but I think transformational in terms of having that experience and being able to do things with it. And I call that the sort of pushing marketing of it, where, like, you're really pushing it with features and functionalities that you just can't get anywhere else. Those are two. Uh, look, other great applications that we're seeing is if you look at HoloLens, which is augmented reality, uh, Minecraft. You just imagine playing Minecraft in augmented reality, where literally the buildings and things you're building are on your coffee table in your den. And it's fully three-dimensional. You can walk around it and touch it and move it. And it's sort of like people often say, you know, Minecraft is like a game slash digital version of Lego. Well, imagine that actually coming together where you're physically building it, moving your hands, and you can see it as a three-dimensional physical object that sits on a table because of the power of augmented reality and hollow. And, and there's, there's, I can go on and on in terms of applications and opportunities. Well, I'd love to, um, you know, kind of transition to, but, I mean, first of all, Super intriguing the ones that you mentioned. I mean, just like wow, right? I mean, that be that's that that is amazing that um, you know they've jumped. You know, a company like you know like Lowe's jumps into something like that because that's a phenomenal idea. But uh, should should we? You know, are these technologies right now mainly for big businesses on big budgets? And, and if not, what what are do you have any use cases for smaller companies on smaller budgets? How they can utilize you know the, the, these new technologies? Yeah, I mean, it's, so it's, it's interesting because there's a side that says, look, for this to work from brain power to development to tools to technology, it can be an expensive process, yes. But I go back to early days of the Internet, and it would have been easy to say only big companies can have websites. What actually made the Internet the Internet was that yeah, a bit more ingenuity, a bit more elbow grease, but anybody – could build a website and be on the web. And I, I would like to bring that approach and that thinking and that ethos to AR and VR because otherwise what happens is we get caught in a world where only the FANG businesses can do this, right? Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google. I mean, you know, the, it's just like you know, they call FANG as the big sort of the tech five. And I don't want that to be – it probably is an inevitability that it's going to be consolidated amongst just a handful, if not less, of global conglomerates, welcome to Skynet type of thing, for sure. But right now, I think what makes it interesting is that because this is new, because there's a new language, because there's a new medium, because it's a new opportunity, 
that yes, I'm hopeful that more and more people will see it as an opportunity. The problem, of course, is just mass adoption. It's not like everyone, I mean, it's, it's true and it's not true, right? It's not like everybody has this in the palm of their hands, but they sort of do. Because if you have a mobile phone and then you do have something like the Happy Meal or Google Cardboard, which are these, these are, you know, the sort of viewer parts are basically free. It's only like they're charging for those. You can get there faster. But again, it's just a question of, are your customers there? Is this a real value? Or are you doing this more to create PR, to be first, to just be experimental, to be innovative, to think about new things? Or is it where you look at it, and my favorite example of looking at things differently is a company like Toyota. Your know, Toyota, while yes, they are big, and yes, what they did is a bold move, they put out a patent for an augmented reality windshield for a car. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, good for Toyota to do that and other automotive makers will or won't, and with autonomous vehicles, what kind of a conflict does that happen? Um, I, I'm not sure. That being said, I believe that that ethos, that philosophy can come from any company. For a company to spend half a day over a box of pizza trying these out, putting a bunch, you know, putting a HoloLens on the table, putting an Oculus Rift on the table, putting um, a Google Cardboard on the, tail, on the table, trying them, get, immersing the team in it and going, what would we do if we had uh, the opportunity? That type of thinking I, I, I know has been democratized and accept, uh, accessible to any brand. Mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned uh, the Google Cardboard. I know that's like 20 bucks, you know, to or something like that to get those. Look, so, you, could go like, to, you could go to an industry trade show, and then, you know, most of them are giving them away as promo items, those types of things. So I, I almost yeah. feel like, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty around if you want to play around with it. And those are something that you, you know, medium-sized business can, or, you know, even a small business that's looking to do a big sales push, you know, they, they could send those directly to people through through the mail along with, instructions on what to view and it could be which is exactly a through what their plant or something like that you know or whatever yeah, I, you know there's there's two examples of that one is the new york times included the cardboard in their sunday newspaper and they supplemented it obviously with real content the content was extremely powerful and immersive virtual reality experiences one of them was it was being able to walk through a syrian refugee camp and i can tell you that there's nothing more mm. more transformative wow. than you know we talk about Syrian refugee camps and we hear all about them and we're in, we're in a very contentious political season obviously especially in the states and it's another thing to put on this, this to to put it on literally to hold the viewer and suddenly you see a bunch of kids who are looking at you in this desert and these tents made of you know plastic wrappers and you know we, we our hearts typically go out to refugees of any kind. But to be there and feel like you've been transformed and you are in this camp, uh, there's nothing that will bring you to your knees faster in terms of walking a mile in someone's shoes. So that's one way that, you're right, it has been done where New York Times basically distributed and every so, few months or so often they release newer types of experiences, some of them more entertainment-based, some of them more art-based, some of them more social cause-based. The other one is uh, – the Volvo, when they launched the XC90, the SUV, they wanted people to have a more immersive experience. They're trying to move the brand in a bit of a more luxurious, different direction beyond just safety. Safety is still critical for them. And the idea was that you almost went for a test drive with these. And so whether you were at the, at the, at the, at the dealership and you'd get one or you'd ask for one, right, because you could ask for one, think about I'm not just collecting your email now. I have your address. I'm sending you one. What was your experience like? Can I help you with it if you didn't do it yet? Lots of ways to engage with that customer. Um, along mm -hmm. the way, and you're right to, to sort of just flip that to a B2B model. I mean, absolutely. Here's here is what our factory looks like. Here is how mm -hmm. we service our customers. Here is a real three-dimensional immersive experience about what it's like. Or here, augmented reality. You know, in your own office. Let's go into our space together and let me walk you through it. And you can point out the things you have questions about, and we'll work it from there. There's so many. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the thing here. We're at such early days that all we're. It's almost like early days of TV. Where what was TV day one? It was basically people on the radio talking in front of a camera. That's mm -hmm. where we're at with this. I mean, people yeah. are getting smarter with it, and they're getting more yeah. immersive for sure, and they're understanding it. But there's a whole world of usability, experience, and deliverability of this that we haven't mastered yet. There's ideas, and they're good ideas, and they make a lot of sense, and they're transformative in comparison to what the web was and is. Yeah. But there's still a way to go. Yeah, exactly. And, and it might feel simple, like – and again, for all listeners out there, I mean, you, I mean this – 
shooting a video of your plant, doing a walkthrough, best if you can do it with, you know, a 360-degree camera. And, and I do know that those are out there, the lower end, for in the low hundreds. So it, it's it's affordable. And But this could count as getting these Google Cardboards, you know, and if you have a decent enough price point, just do the math. Take, you know, for if you do this 50 of these to people who inquire about your company or your product or services and you send them out, you're looking at a, in the low thousand dollars of an investment, you know, counting postage, counting the cardboard, counting getting the video shot, and just do the math. I mean, it, it can be done, and it's as simple as shooting a 360-degree video, sending them this stuff, creating a good experience. But, you know, as Mitchell probably attests to, the, you know, the – you know, it really comes down to the creativity and having it make sense and make sure that you give people either an applicable or a fun experience. So the creative obviously is a huge part of it, but it can be done. And, and um, I think Mitch is showing, you know, that for big budgets, small budgets, I mean, it's, it's all out there for the taking. And it's going to come down to creativity because there, some of the barriers have come down a little bit, at least with, you know, like you're saying about the, you know, the Google Cardboard and whatnot. Now, on the technology front, just curious. Um, Google Glasses, obviously, they didn't really take off um, as much as, you know, they would have. And, again, that could just be the early adopter thing. But just out of curiosity, and you mentioned a couple other um, technologies that are coming out. Like, I think you mentioned the HoloLens. What, what else do you see? Do you see anything out there happening, uh, you know, anything else besides the Oculus Rift? And is there anything else in development that, that you're seeing coming down the pipeline here that we can, should be on the lookout for? Well, HoloLens is here, and you can go to the Microsoft stores and try it out. You can order it online. Uh, the Google Glass is a great question thought. I, I feel like it's, a lot of times it's just timing. You know, why MySpace mm -hmm. and why Facebook? Why, right. you know, YouTube yeah. and not Vimeo? Why Snapchat and not, or, you know, Periscope? And, like, you can sort of go through, like, a lineage of, 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 a, of a digital carcasses, <laughs> you will, and see, like, some things just sort of, like, there's this sort of magical thing of product, place, time, acceptance, zeitgeist that is very hard to sort of whip together. And I find it really curious, you know, Snap Inc., formerly Snapchat, has launched these spectacles to allow people to shoot and give perspective in a different way, and no one's laughing at that, but people laughed really hard at the sort of Google Glass that literally became called, you know, came known as these glass holes is how people were describing people who wear, wore them back in the day. Like, it's pretty mind-blowing. And um, I think that only not I've had uh, something to do with that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fun, yeah. Well, I idea. think everybody just jumped on because it was like a weird sort of thing. But, again, you know, we forget that it was weird seeing people walking down the street talking on a phone for a while, you know, back when mobile phones first came in. It was like, who, you know, really before true. if you were walking down the street talking to yourself, you looked like a crazy person. Now if you're walking down the street not talking to yourself, you look like a crazy person. And that's <laughs> just the sort of cycle of adoption of technology. So the Google Glass one is one that perplexes me in the sense of everybody is very bullish on AR and VR. Google Glass was clearly an augmented reality platform, and yet they were very quick to let it die. And I think it just had to do at this point with timing and application. My guess is that had Google Glass gone in the direction of B2B application and been there for surgeons and engineers and started in that arena, we would probably be lauding them as the, the real sort of inventors of the platform. I really do think that. Now it's sort of being awarded almost to Google for Cardboard and Oculus for, um, for, for virtual reality with Facebook. I mean, Microsoft has some work to do, too, and there's, there's stuff that's going to happen in there as well. Um, I, I'm, when you say, like, what to look for, I'm very bullish right now on, on when the phone is the center point. So that's why I do like things like the Samsung. I do like things like Cardboard. There's no doubt that there is a lot of excitement over Sony and PlayStation because having it built into the Play platform is a very, very good gateway to a more mass audience. Um, it's hard to read because there's so much money being thrown at this with so many major players. I still think we haven't even come close to having our sort of VHS beta moment yet where it's like which platform will win. And I don't think it's going to be an AR versus VR. I think we're going to both augment reality and virtual reality. But I do think we need to have a unified platform. And, again, this goes back to, like, mobile comparisons where – People sometimes don't remember this. I remember when text messaging first started happening in North America. It was always already very advanced in areas of the world like Asia and Europe. 
you couldn't text message somebody unless you were on the same carrier. There wasn't even interoperability. So I couldn't text somebody on Verizon if I was on T-Mobile. Now, clearly we overcame that and text, mo text messaging became a ubiquitous platform, which now we see even the evolution of messaging today, how powerful that is. AR and VR in their own instances have not had that moment. So if you look at VR, it's hard to tell will it be Google or Facebook. And the answer is, or will it be Sony? I, we, it's hard to tell right now, but clearly the market will not have room for four, five, six players. It just won't be like that. There's going to have to be some form of unification. So instead of saying, you know, which are the ones that are coming that we should look at, I think we have to look short term and go, it's nice when it's in the mobile phone and all you got to do is slide the phone into something. That's nice. If you're going to go sort of, you know, that whole HMD, that whole head mounted display way where it's like the hardware on your brain, there's going to have to be some sort of consolidation here. And, and I don't know where to bet. I mean, you know, Google or Facebook, where do you want to put your bets? Tough call. Yeah. yeah, and you never know. Maybe the the camera will invert itself on our phones, and we can look out <laughs> onto stuff. And, and we'll, yeah, and people are know. talking about things like uh, contact lenses. People are talking about the things like when the technology is so good that you don't need anything. That like you could just look at a wall, and by making a motion or a face motion or a voice, it'll pull up some form of tech. I mean. There's a lot of eager beavers here, and you know, I always laugh. It's like I think about the HoloLens in Star Trek because I'm one of those types of nerds, and I'm like, wow, we're like basically there with some of these platforms, and how long will it be until it's not even the holodeck? It's just everywhere. Don't know. Yeah, yeah in, in, in the spirit of the you know, universal um, you know, applications of it, I, I know that you know, one of the uses of augmented reality is, is on – uh, physical pieces, printed pieces, walls, postcards, possibly even billboards, posters, banners, whatever, and you can hold your phone up to it, and it can do it. Now, I, I you know, you know, grew up in the, you know, in the printing world, and I, I saw AR fizzle, and I think the one of the main reasons it's fizzled because it was way better than QR codes, but there were, there were universal QR code readers. And with augmented reality, you, everybody had to have their own individual app. And I think that was a big problem for the other side of the equation, which is the marketplace and the people who are going to be doing it, because it would be annoying to have to download all these different apps. Do you, do you know um, if that will change, or is it possible for that? I mean, I guess everything's possible, but do you see that possibly changing with AR having like a universal augmented reality reader like you do for with QR codes? Yeah, I mean, that's basically what I was saying, as I think that there needs to be, you know, one ring to rule them all in mm -hmm. AR and the same thing in VR, and those are going to be different platforms. But I also think that you're bringing up a really salient point, which is, even if we have it, and even if it works, and even if it's 4K seamless streaming, not massive files, doesn't make you throw up because it's nauseating, whatever the sort of, again, those speed bumps that we have that we need to overcome to get there, it's still about the experience. I would actually argue that AR and QR codes didn't fail at physical spaces because of the technology hurdle. I'd argue that the people who used it and tried it had a terrible experience because what happened after you used it was a bad experience. And we, you know, again, Scott Stratton, QR codes kills kittens and all of that world of like how bad those, you know, people putting QR codes on moving trucks and stuff. I mean, just terrible. And then when you finally did use it, you went to like their, their mobile website, which was just a terrible version of their right. big website and didn't really have anything or was a bad call to action or bad experience. Imagine if this was good. Like imagine if you actually did a QR code or an AR experience and it led to just an experience you couldn't get anywhere else. The thing that would happen next is that person, that one, that, that sort of, you know, patient one, zero, the monkey, you know, that has the infection, would spread that virus like crazy. They'd be talking about it from mountaintops. You have to try this. This is game changing. This is going to change your world. I couldn't believe how good you go on and on and on and on through this. So. I don't think that it's a question of technology and ubiquity and the one ring to rule them all. I think we have to get there for there to be some sort of unified platform to make this work. I'm more worried about what we do with it. And again, if the whole VR experience of Volvo, once you finally get this thing and plug it in, was to just be able to look at the website in a different way, major fail. But if the experience is something I could only get once I get those you know, Google Cardboard branded versions of Volvo you know, eyewear to me, 
I would not only, you know, you, I would probably be inclined to have everybody I know try the test drive. And whether or not they were yeah. in market for a Volvo, that would be, you know, that would be tattooed on your brain, which is all the brand does, right? It wants to create that indelible mark on the individual. Yeah. So I, I actually, you know, would, would push back and say it, this wasn't a question of AR being too early or QR codes not working. It was a question of the experience wasn't worth the effort. And that's gotcha. a problem. That's a marketing problem you and I could do a podcast on, you know, in its entirety. Absolutely. Yeah, and if you work with any of those big car brands, uh, give them the idea of, um, you know, going on a racetrack or doing like a Dukes of Hazard jump, you know, like being within the car on something like that. I think that would be – I'm just thinking to myself as you were talking, I was like, yeah, that, I, would, I would definitely want to see that, <laughs> you know. I would definitely want to get in there. So magic question, um, when do you see this taking off? Well, great question, Dave. And my answer to you is the future happens really slowly and then all at once. <laughs> <laughs> That's when. I don't know. I mean, right. It's, you probably, it's get, really you probably hard. get stuff like that all the time. Mitch, tell me. I need to know. You have to have this answer. And, you know, you've been – I love I, mean, I love experts like you that are – this is what I know, this is what I think, and this is what I don't know. And I, I can appreciate, you know, not having an answer because the answer is not there yet. You know? Yeah, and 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 you know, I look at it. There's like two sides of it for me. Where where um, one side is it, there's a lot of money, and a lot of the big players, or Google's, or Facebook's, or Sony, or Microsoft's, all betting big on this. So there's a sort of push to get consumers there, and I feel it, and it feels now and imminent. Right, Oculus is now, Microsoft Hololens is now, Google Cardboard is now, Google Tango Project. I mean, there's a million things happening now. It's clear Sony PlayStation is coming. It's like it's now. But when is everybody going to be like, yeah, yeah, let's go? <sighs> E-commerce, you know, mobile, smartphones, applications, I mean, websites. So we could go on and on. And, and we could also, you and I could debate, like, so when did, when did the web really hit? What year was it? And it would be really hard for you and I, who are both living and breathing in this space, to pinpoint. Did I, you know, I think about, we're doing a podcast here. Like I said, I started my podcast over 11 years ago. 11 I've never missed an episode every week, about, you know, 30 minutes to an hour every single episode. And you might, I'm not saying that because, like, look at me, look how great I am. But I find it hilarious that in the media right now is this is the year of podcasting. 11 <laughs> years I've been doing a show. Like, and yeah. people like Mark Marin, uh, who have similar formats, these sort of long-form, in-depth conversations, and I'm not saying Mark did not copy me, probably doesn't even know that I exist, although he's been on the show, um, with similar sort of formats that he developed his five, six years after I did. And again, mm-hmm. not because I did it, just he decided on his own format that happened to be similar to where I was going with it. And here we sit with hundreds and hundreds and years and years of episodes, and somebody might argue – Fairly right now, podcasting hasn't even come close to having its moment yet. So mm-hmm. you're asking me about a platform that we are in the sort of mosaic web browser moment of. I, oof, I, I would be, I would hazard to guess, other than Kevin Kelly. Future happens really slowly, then all at once. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, Mitch, this has been fun. Um, it's really neat hearing you talk about this because I know you are right on, you know, the edge of this, and it's. It, the future is exciting, and especially in the marketing world. And, and we'll see what all happens, but everyone does need to pay attention to these and start to dip your toes in it because when it does take off, you'll be ahead of everybody else and, and be ready to really get you know really deeply immersed in it. Um, do you have any other parting thoughts uh, you'd like to leave our listeners with? Um, well, I would uh, tag on to what you said. I would tag on and basically say um, – you know, you have to sort of be somewhat bullish. You you might want to be investing ahead of the curve. You might want to try and figure out when that curve is happening, when that spot's going to happen. But ultimately, it's coming and it is here. And if someone said to me today, they are focusing as a marketing agency solely on creating augmented and virtual reality experiences, or even just virtual reality experiences, or just augmented reality experiences for brands, I wouldn't look at them sideways and think, oh, you're going to be bankrupt next year. I would actually look at them and think, this is a this is a company that if they do this well probably could have a very long runway. Can they make it through? Can they can they sustain themselves while the industry sorts itself out? That's the risk of entrepreneurship. Yeah, that's 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 right. Yeah, that's basically it in a nutshell. All right, Mitch. Hey, how can people continue to learn from you? Oh, best thing is just go online, search for Mitch Joel on Google, and everything I I have and, and am is right there. 
All right. Awesome. Well, Mitch, appreciate your time. Uh, looking forward to uh, continuing to talk about subjects like this and others. And, and who knows, maybe in, in a year we'll uh, revisit this podcast and, and, and see where, we're, where, where we are a year from today on, on this stuff. Be because fine. It, it, uh, sure. it changes quickly. changes quickly. Yeah, well, sure thank you so much, Mitch. It was a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.